This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. And I'm joined this week, as I always am, by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology and the host of this show and our interviews, Dr. David Henry and Dr. Henry we talked about this uh, last time, we'll talk about it again this time. It's 2020 and we're excited for some big things coming, some potential changes and improvements, and it's going to be an exciting year. So early in the year, it makes sense to bring back one of our favorite guests uh, who we'll be featuring this week, Dr. Haller. Back. Yeah, it really is exciting. I, I know him well, and uh, our listeners may recall he is a former editor of the Journal of Community Oncology, of clinical oncology called JCO. And so, of course, he's really got his fingers on the pulse of what's happening in oncology. He's a particular GI specialist. And we, we talked about some recent ASCO, ESMO discussions of GI tumors, and he highlights the IDEA trial, something called the Beacon trial about BRAF and MEK mutations and how you might uh, use drugs in other things like melanoma to treat GI cancers where there's BRAF and MEK mutation, and then pembrolizumab, one of the immuno-oncology antibodies in gastric cancer. So really interesting stuff that he learns and shares. Yeah, and of course, we, yeah, like you mentioned, we get to talk about Pembrolizumab. It seems like you can't go two or three episodes without talking uh, right. about your, your, some of your the favorite antibodies. Immunotherapy. Yeah, I know, right? They're, they're everywhere. The, this they're week, everywhere. The, in clinical correlation, Dr. Alana Yerkowitz talks about uh, something I think very interesting. She does a good job of occasionally talking about things that seem maybe uh, important in pop culture, like she did one on diet. This time it's about age. Not every patient with every diagnosis has a similar age uh, and how, can, how that can affect treatment It'll plans and life plans. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what she says about this and, and her thoughts, because I would jump right to an age, if you take a younger patient in the 20s, an older patient, maybe in the 70s, and the quality of life scores, this has been studied, are very different because younger patients get symptoms much sooner because they're not used to them, don't like them, and report mm -hmm. them. Whereas the seniors go, oh, well, you know, a little ache in the back and the pain or uh, this or that, uh, I'm used to that, it doesn't bother me so much. So you see a very different quality of life score output from youngsters versus seniors. And the, the interesting thing about that is I suppose you would want seniors to report more and not just, you know, for lack of a better term, rub some dirt on it, but to, to communicate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and this is a problem, which she may cover. You'll see a patient um, who was three weeks ago treated and say, you know, how things go? Well, I had th these three things. Wow, why didn't you call me? Oh, really? Uh, I didn't think you should know. Whereas the younger patient, not used to this, would call, you know, am I supposed to have that? Um, small lump on my IV where a site where I was injected. So we sometimes have to counsel them and get a little stern with them that they need to report these symptoms. So that's Clinical Correlation with Dr. Alani Yerkowitz. It is, of course, coming up after our interview. Dr. Henry, let's do it. Let's do it. Dr. Dan Haller one more time. He's going to keep coming back. He's going to be one of our, our Here our he comes. Always worth it. So here we do it one more time with Dr. Haller. You're listening to Blood and Cancer, and I'm your host, Dr. David Henry, of our online journal, mdedge.com slash hematology-oncology. And each week, we try and bring you some interesting practical issues from hot stuff at meetings or presentations on a blood or cancer. And, and this issue, this episode, I'm delighted to have friend and colleague here at Penn, Dr. Dan Haller. Dan, welcome again to our podcast. Thank you, David. So Dan is a former editor of the JCO and practicing oncologist thought leader at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, and he's recently come back from the ESMO, European Society of Medical Oncology, GI emphasis, GI section, and uh, Dan has told me, just to highlight for our listeners what we're going to talk about, that some interesting data and results and perhaps practice changing, the Beacon trial for BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, Second thing we'll talk about is cell-free DNA. I, th I think that's so interesting. We'll get into and its impact on three or six months in the IDEA trial. And then switching from colorectal to gastric, we'll talk about Keynote 062, the pembrolizumab, with or without chemotherapy. So, Dan, you want to start with the Beacon trial, BRAF mutant colorectal cancer? Sure. So the, the issue is that patients with BRAF mutations have their dismal prognosis. Even in the clinical trial setting, these folks representing about 8% about of patients, and these, all of these are wild-type rats, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, since they're mutually exclusive to be dub double mutants, um, 
and therefore eligible to be treated with an EGF inhibitor, EGFR inhibitor, um, this dismal prognosis is like one quarter of the, the rest of the population. They typically present with very symptomatic disease. They have bulky disease, peritoneal disease, um, and they don't get to third-line therapy typically. You're lucky if they get to second line. So a while back... And is this more right colon, more right colon than left colon? More right colon. That's okay. correct, and it may be a major contributor to why right colon tumors, among other uh, mutations and biologic variants, that's okay. why right colon tumors do worse. So we learned early on that if you gave just a simple DRAF inhibitor, uh, like dabrafenib or venurafenib or encorafenib to patients, they don't behave like melanoma with the same exact mutation, V6100E. And one of the reasons for that, Scott Cope has said, and the Anderson figures this out, is when you do block, you actually upregulate, block BRAF, you upregulate the EGFR receptor, no. um, which simply means that you drive the tumor, and tumors actually grow a bit faster. So to address that, um, he added, and the cooperative groups added in the clinical trial second line, a renotecan with cetuximab or a renotecan cetuximab plus uh, than urafenib. Mm-hmm. And what was shown was that the PFS was doubled, the, um, the response rate was doubled, and overall survival was not affected because of the 50% who went off after, after just two, two months, um, they were crossed over to receive the BRAF inhibitor. So that's where we stood until the Beacon trial came out, and this was just published in the New England Journal on November 24th. Okay. Um, October 24th, I'm sorry. So Go and read it. Um, it's a very interesting piece. Um, what they wanted to do was see whether adding a third biologic without chemotherapy, targeting another target, MET, would be more effective. So it's a three-arm study of either control, which was full theory, um, and then triple therapy with encarafenib, dinimetinib. Mm-hmm. Luckily, they name them so you know which target they're hitting, yes. and cetuximab. Or a doublet of just the BRAF inhibitor and paracinib with cetuximab. And the primary endpoint was overall survival. Okay. So the results are positive with one caveat. So there were only two comparisons, triple versus control and double versus control, not triple versus double, mm-hmm. which would have ramped up the, the sample size. Um, so the median overall survival for the triple is nine months compared to 5.4 months. So that's, that's a pretty big impact. Um, uh, I have the ratio of 0.52. Um, the confirmed response rate is 26% versus 2% with full theory alone. So I, I think that's a clearly positive study. Um, and it's, it, it's in the NCCN guidelines now that people get reimbursed for it. The, the, the hang up is that the overall survival for the doublet was 0.6 months less than the triplet, 0.6. Uh-huh. So a little more than two weeks mm-hmm. um, with more adverse events, as you would guess. And I might add more expense, obviously, with the price of biologics in the marketplace. So I think there's going to be debate. Um, I hope there is debate, open debate, about whether everyone needs the triplet. Can we figure out who those people are that are benefiting or whether a doublet uh, alone without chemotherapy would be uh, a good idea? Would the, the, the triple arm toxicity issues are not so bad? It was uh, the, the adverse events grade three or higher was about 60 percent for triple 50% for doublet and 60% for the control group. Okay. So sulfur is actually the most toxic therapy. Okay. All right. Well, that, uh, that's uh, fascinating with the, a, a non-chemo arm like we're starting to see in lung cancer. So right. it's in the New England Journal. We'll read it. And then um, our second topic to... So this co- is now, just to say, this is now second line in the NCCM guidelines for people with BRAF mutation. For the triple. Okay. Triple. Okay, and then um, we wanted to go to what I think is so interesting because it's such a, a coming technology, which is um, fascinating. They can detect cell-free DNA of your tumor. Um, you want to talk about cell-free DNA impact on three or six months, which takes us to, of course, the IDEA trial. What did you hear there? So this is very important. So circulating tumor DNA um, in every disease has been a very powerful prognostic uh, predictor. In, in any tumor, if you have the primary removed and you have circulating tumor DNA before any anticipated uh, adjuvant therapy, that's a bad sign. And if you have a positive fill after the end of the adjuvant chemotherapy, it's a dreadful sign yeah. uh, for, for outcome. 
So this is now being integrated into studies in stage two disease in particular, um, where you want to select out the patients at highest risk um, and lowest risk. And this is an additional way of doing it. So we're going to meld that into the IDEA trial. So I've talked about it before. The IDEA trials were six worldwide studies addressing the question as to whether oxaliplatin-based chemotherapy for three or six months uh, were, were different and was one superior to the other. And obviously the whole endpoint here is improvement in, in neuropathy. So yes. this has been presented also in the New England Journal and discussed many times. That the, pot, the primary endpoint was met. There was clearly much, much less peripheral neuropathy with three versus six. And the bottom line of this, of, of, and this is also in the NCCN guidelines, is that people who got three months of KPOX did the best of all, mm -hmm. three months of therapy, um, and did better than Folfox, in part because it's more dose intense. You get much more oxaliplatin and more continuous fluoropyrimidine therapy with KPOX than with Folfox. So this is in the T3N1 group. In the T4N2 high-risk group, um, they did poorly with either treatment, with uh, uh, disease-free survival, three, three or DFS of about 50%. So these okay. folks probably need more than six months of anything, and they may need, for example, sulfoxyurea, which is being tested in a clinical trial in France and Canada. So people, some people are uncomfortable shortening therapy. Uh, some people are, are accepting it. Some people do a hybrid where they give three months of KPOX or Folfox and then simply 5-FU or Capecitabine for an additional three months um, and th therefore preserve the low neuropathy. So one thing we're waiting on is overall survival because the correlation of DFS, three-year DFS and overall survival by Dan Sargent was based on six months of therapy, not three. Mm. So many people are waiting for survival data to be, to be revealed, which probably will be next year for the earliest studies. The group in France, uh, about 2,000 patients were entered into their trial. 90% got full thoughts, surprisingly. Um, and they showed very similar results to the main study. But what they did was look at circulating tumor DNA before starting adjuvant chemotherapy um, and looked at three versus six months. And what they found was that, um, interestingly enough, the, the people who had positive circulating tumor DNAs, again, did did miserably, um, but in the but in the CTDNA positive patients, six months of treatment looked to be preferable. So this technology is not easily available yet. Right. Um, it's a little bit like doing liquid biopsies, but it will come. It will come at at some point, and people will start using it as another prognostic indicator for patients um, with um, with uh, adjuvant colon cancer. In, especially in stage three disease. So if I understand the T3N1s, as you said, per idea, the, the K-Box or Xelox, as we sometimes call it, was fine for three months as opposed to six months. But in this study, if you were circulating cell-free pre-adjuvant therapy, it seemed like you needed the six months. Correct. Okay. Well, that's really the helpful. The one interesting thing here also is that, is that the, the CTDNA positive patients treated for six months had a similar prognosis to the CTDNA negative patients treated for three. Huh. So that's a group that you can convert. Mm -hmm. so, Fascinating. I, and as you said, overall survival, I remember you've taught us uh, the Dan Sargent three-year disease-free correlates to five-year overall survival, but I hadn't remembered it's that six months was the it, adjuvant correct. therapy. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, and actually well, even a year because some of that data was developed on the 5 of the Vamisol 12 month data. Okay. So. I'm old enough to remember that. Okay. Um, then you wanted to switch to gastric and uh, right. Keynote 062, which, of course, always keys us into pembrolizumab studies. So this was pembrolizumab with or without chemotherapy and first-line gastric. How'd that go? Interesting, as all of these IO studies do, because people don't know how to write the studies for them. <laughs> And they, they, they're very complicated. So this is not a particular disclaimer. I chair all of the gastric and esophageal DSMBs for Merck for Pembro. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew this study. I've grown up with this study, and I've seen its trial and tribulation. So one of the uh, discussants of this particular paper uh, presented both at ASCO and GI-ASMO and ASMO proper um, made the point 
that the studies are so complicated and they've been changed so many times with so many different endpoints and very complex combined endpoints that we're getting complicated results that are difficult to explain. So in this, in this study, which was a three-arm study, patients were treated up front um, with, a, uh, um, with pembrolizumab alone, pembrolizumab chemotherapy alone, which was Cape cytobine or 5-FU plus cisplatin, or the combination of chemotherapy plus Pembro. Okay. Uh, so that, that, those were the three arms. Very large study, multiple endpoints. The primary endpoint was overall survival in people with a combined positive score of one or higher. Although they also looked at patients with combined positive scores, CPSs, of greater than 10. Um, this, this differs from, uh, from study to study, even among the gastric studies. And, of course, as um, I recall for, for our audience, that, uh, that, com- that positive score takes into account the hotness, so to speak, of the tumor immunologically correct. and the pdl one I think, is folded into that? That's correct. Okay. It's a, it's a number. It's a portion of pdl one positive cells in the sample. Okay. So they also looked at PFS. They also looked at response rate. Uh, so they looked at three primary endpoints, and then they had some combined endpoints. Um, so oh. the... They had to have again. A, they had to have some positivity for PDL1. So there were over 750 patients randomized. Um, this was a well balanced study. Toxicity. There were no signals, new signals about either chemotherapy or Pembro uh, on this particular study. So as to the first question, Pembro versus chemotherapy, uh, Pembro was non inferior okay. if they had a CPS greater than one, and okay. it was even better if they had a. CPS greater than 10. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was important. And, and over 10, the hazard ratio was 0.69. So that's pretty good. Um, interestingly, when you took that active drug and you added it to chemotherapy, it was not superior. It was not, su- hazard, not superior. Not superior, okay. even in the CPS greater than 0.85. Hmm. Hmm. So the, the response rate was, was higher, um, for sure. Um, it was about, uh, if I recall... In, in the very positive patients, for Pembro alone, it was about 20%, which is good, um, obviously, um, and much better than even for the chemotherapy arms in this particular study. Um, so I, I think the, uh, the, the bottom line for this is, is the same as for the lung cancer studies that were presented last year at ASCO, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is where the curves cross. That is, when you start, when you start Pembro alone, people drop off very quickly. And then when, when they get out at a certain point, the ones who, who are the survivors, they have very long durations of response. So it's, more, it's, easy, it's hard to describe on the phone, but if you see two curves separated at the top and then about six months out coming together, which is about where the median is, that's why you don't see a difference in median survival. But then the chemotherapies keep dying off, but the responders to the Pembro keep, keep on. And I think the practical endpoint to this, and a lot of people are doing this, is to start everybody on chemo, which works right away. And at the time when you probably will be dropping out platinum or taxol because of neurotoxicity, dropping out the chemotherapy and then using, if you will, maintenance pembrolizumab or maintenance. Well, that's a really fascinating idea. It makes perfect sense from what you said. Now, that is that can you hedge your bet still with the, the, the tumor score, the pdl one or you would still, say, get your responses going with the chemotherapy and then start switch over to your antibody at the right time? If I, re- if I recall when I'm looking at these 1,000 pages we get every six months for these studies, it, the CPS score didn't really have an effect on the early drop-off. Mm-hmm. So I probably would not use that as a, discriminator, the, the, a, a discriminating uh, agent, if you will, uh, or measure to determine who should be on Pembro alone and who should start with some chemotherapy. And this is now we can go, this is NCCN and or FDA approved, so we can go to this first line. That's correct. With, with, do you recall? Do you have to have some PDL one one percent or greater, or is that independent? It, it depending on the tumor type. In some, it was in esophageal, for example, in one of the trials, they accepted everybody, and there was not a huge difference among the PDL one positives and the ones that are not. I don't think we know everything we need to know about 
about the immuno-oncology for sure. Well, you know, for, for, with regard to toxicity, everyone's used this chemo, this uh, antibody, but I really like your suggestion, get your responses going, people start to get tired of the chemotherapy and they're still going and are starting to fail, and then you can switch off that toxicity right. for the Pembro, which we know and uh, mostly not toxic, but some people will, and maybe sustain or get some better responses. Exactly. Well, wonderful meeting. Where is ESMO next year? ESMO is proper. will be in Madrid. Madrid. Okay. Well, And ESMO GI is perpetually in Barcelona. Oh, is that right? So it's always in Barcelona. It's like ASCO GI is perpetually in San Francisco. Okay. So <laughs> Certain now that I'm deputy editor of the Annals of Oncology, I actually have to go to every single meeting, which oh. is not a burden. Well, if you, if you need an assistant, uh, I'm, I'm available. <laughs> Well, Dan, I, I know you've just traveled and just got back, and you're so nice to take the time to talk to us and go through these three important uh, studies and information. So I want to thank Dr. Dan Haller for being on our podcast today on blood and cancer. We are of the online journal, mds.com slash hematology-oncology. Many of our, all of our podcasts are archived, so you can find them there. We want to recognize our three residents at Pennsylvania Hospital, Ronak Mystery, Sue Landy, Emily Breyer, who dutifully do show notes, so there'll be bullet points of what Dr. Haller has just said on our webpage. And so um, without further ado, Dan, we thank you so much and thank our audience for listening. And that concludes the interview portion of our show this week. Don't forget there are robust show notes available wherever notes are found in your app. Blood and Cancer will be right back with Clinical Correlation and Dr. Alana Yerkowitz right after this. Welcome back to Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MD Edge Hematology Oncology. You can find more hematology oncology news at mdedge.com slash hematology oncology. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter, as well as I'm on Twitter and Dr. Yerkowitz is on Twitter and Dr. Henry is on Twitter as well. Okay, without any further ado, let's get to clinical correlation with Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. I'm Dr. Alana Yerkowitz, and this is Clinical Correlation, a segment about the human side of hematology and oncology care. Age is just a number. We've all heard this adage. Turns out, it's just as true in hematology and oncology as it is in life. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about how we evaluate a person's age when it comes to making recommendations about treatment for cancer. By far, the most important factor to consider in giving chemotherapy and picking a chemotherapy regimen is what we in the field call fitness. Fitness refers to how well a person is expected to be able to tolerate a toxic regimen. It's all about weighing risk and benefits, and given a snapshot in time, we try as hard as we can to predict this accurately. The most important factor that goes into determining fitness is age. But I think we've all met 75-year-olds who are about as fit as 60-year-olds, and 75-year-olds who are more like 90-year-olds. So age is indeed just a number, a guideline, but not an absolute, in determining fitness. When trying to predict the future, this, of course, leaves great room for error. So much of our evaluations are based on a snapshot in time. We might do a geriatric assessment, and we might ask detailed questions about the person's day-to-day life and ability to function, But it's still only a snapshot compared to this person's everyday life. And so much hinges on that snapshot. I've seen how devastating it is to get it wrong in both directions. I've met the, quote, fit patient who nearly died from toxic side effects of chemo, as well as the, quote, frail elderly person who sailed right through it. I appreciate those in the field who are working on improved evaluations for age and fitness. There are many, and I thank these people. At the same time, I think it's just as important to appreciate our own humility in these evaluations. We do our best to predict how a person will do, but at the end of the day, it's just that, a prediction, subject to human error. Age is just a number, fitness just a forecast. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll tune in next time for Clinical Correlation. And that concludes the 53rd edition of Blood and Cancer by MD Edge. I'm the voice of MD Edge Podcasts, Nick Andrews. Blood and Cancer is hosted by Editor-in-Chief of MD Edge Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. All MD Edge Podcasts are produced by Executive Editor Kathy Scarbeck, Editor Mary Ellen Schneider, Multimedia Editor Terry Rudd, 
and our social media is produced by Kyla Clark. Blood and Cancer, new episodes every Thursday by MD Edge. <laughs>